This is a really incredible treat that we have the legendary world champion, Gary Kasparov with us, who's also an author, speaker, human rights activist, and um, a tournament that many of you guys have played in. Actually, if you have played in it, why don't you give a Zoom reaction, either a thumbs up or a clap. He is the founder of the Kasparov Chess Foundation, which hosts the KCF All Girls Nationals. Yeah, I know a lot of you have played in that before. And um, we also have the Queen's Gambit director and co-creator and writer and executive producer, Scott Frank with us, which is so incredibly exciting because I know that even if some of you haven't been able to watch this series on Netflix, you know that it's the number one series and it's really igniting a lot of interest in chess and particularly in girls and women in chess. So um, that's like super exciting to me and I hope to all of you. So before we get started and get some insight into Gary's work consulting on the Queen's Gambit, um, I wanted to ask um, Scott, because this series, which was based on a book um, by Walter Tevis, is about a female, Beth, who becomes the best chess player in the world. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what attracted you to the story and making it into a series for Netflix? Sure, and hello, everybody. Um, thanks for having me here. Um, the 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 book for me, I'd never read about a character like that before. I played chess when I was younger. Um, so I was fascinated to read a book that was, you know, set in the world of chess. And it read to me like a good mystery. It just read, it was a very, it was a real page turner. And she was such a mysterious, interesting character that I became fascinated with her. And also her her genius and her gift um, was something that was really interesting to me too, because it it seemed to, in this case, it cost her a lot, you know, it, it made, she was sort of her own enemy. And um, reading a story like that was just fascinating to me. And it just felt bizarrely enough, even though you wouldn't think of chess when you think about cinematic competition, the book felt very cinematic to me. I, I, there was a tone there that I thought if one could capture it, it could be really interesting. And how did you end up getting involved with Gary Kasparov as a consultant for this? Well, a couple from two different directions. One, two of my close friends um, work on, created the show Game of Thrones. And Gary is a fan <laughs> and they knew these two guys, Dan and Dave, knew I was obsessed with this book. And I had given the book to David Benioff's wife when she was writing a book about a tennis um, prodigy. And I said, you should read this. Um, and they met Gary and they said, you have to meet Gary Kasparov. Would you like to meet him? You just, uh, we can make that happen. We can introduce the two of you via email, which they did. And Bruce Pandolfini, who, you know, the great chess teacher, he was already on as a consultant and he also knew Gary and brought us all, brought us all together. So it was kind of from both those directions. So Gary, can you tell us a little bit about your role and how you went about picking these amazing chess games? Um, two of the, or two excerpts of which we're gonna go over today. Oh, um, yeah, it's the, um, as, as uh, Scott just told you, so I was approached from two different uh, uh, directions. Uh, it's, um, there was a message from uh, uh, um, Ben of Advice, so um, uh, telling me about, about this idea and about Scott's work, um, at, and also um, an email from um, uh, Pandal, Bruce Pandolfini inviting me uh, just to join them for lunch. So we had a lunch uh, um, at the Upper, uh, Upper West Side, so um, in, in my neighborhood, um, walked in the room, actually it took, since I didn't, you know, we never met. So it took me a couple of minutes actually to find you at the table, though you we were quite close to, to, the, to, to, to the entrance. And then we just, you know, we talked about it. So I think it helped that, you know, I, I watched one of, uh, one of uh, Scott's work, Godless. Another another series, just with uh, mainly with female characters, <laughs> yeah, and uh, and I, I loved it. So um, and uh, then he introduced me to his plan, and I just you know asked my opinion, and I thought it's it was a great opportunity, a great moment for me, just to 
to have an impact on a show that I could sense would be a, a great success. And, and it could be a, a tremendous push for the game of chess because I could see that the uh, uniqueness of the character and this, all the struggles of, of Elizabeth Harmon, you know, with, with her uh, um, vices, with, with, with drugs, with alcohol, with psychological trauma of the childhood and how she could, you know, overcome it and, uh, and uh, improve her chess and just go to the very top. It's, it was a very interesting challenge because I knew that every movie that was made about chess, every series had um, certain problems of translating the, um, the spirit of the game, the, the emotions, the, uh, the atmosphere. Um, again, I knew that in every show, even in this one, you had few, you know, gaffes here and there because it's very difficult just to avoid all of them. But I thought that what I could do is just to, to offer my advice, obviously on chess, and, and also on, on the atmosphere of chess competition in the 60s because she had to face Russian, Soviets. And I think I made a few very valuable contributions explaining how, how, this, you know, how this Soviet chess machine worked. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, the, the, the clip that we're about to show is a um, clip featuring a character in the series, Luchenko. Um, was he modeled after anyone? Um, I, I mean, Gary might be able to answer that. He's, he's as he was in the book, I think he was a, a lot of the characters in the book are kind of composites of various, various players. I don't know that he's modeled after anyone in particular, although Gary, am, am I wrong about that? Is there somebody specifically? No, no, it's, this is, they all are composite, you're right, but it's the, but it's, it was not just about the chess character. So what was important is to, to, Explain how the Soviet chess machine worked and the and the very special attention that uh, Soviet authorities and KGB paid to the to the to the Soviet champions. So we we had you know several discussions and very long conversation in Berlin. We met in Berlin and after I read the script, so I came up with tons of suggestions and uh, and Scott always found uh, creating ways of incorporating them and just and and every element that is added there, you know. Uh, made it more and more realistic, and that's why it's just it's 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 as as good as it gets, you know, as close as it could, you can imagine to be the real chess competition. And of course, the the actors uh, they just they did did a great job, and uh, and and uh, I mean she was she was incredible. I mean, just too, she played so naturally. Yeah, she was totally amazing. And actually, it's funnily funnily enough, we actually have several girls who messaged me in this group who auditioned for the, the role of the, uh, the younger Beth, so. Uh, we did a lot of reaching out to various chess clubs early on. And interestingly enough, we ended up casting somebody who didn't know how to play chess <laughs> after all that, because we needed someone who also resembled Anya. And so I decided to err on the side of that, thinking that, you know, Bruce can always teach her how to, how to play chess and how to hold the, Wow, she was phenomenal, um, and you guys did a great job teaching her chess then. I, I, I wasn't aware that she didn't even know how the pieces moved. She was just so good. No, but, um, but we are going to show a quick clip from the series now. I'm going to share my screen with you guys, and uh, we'll talk about the character I just mentioned and uh, a chess game that um, Gary um, modeled for the scene. Um, I, I really, really love that scene. And we got some questions from the girls about it as well. And the women who are in this class about adjournment and how that works, because a lot of them, of course, had never heard of that before. Um, but tell us, um, Scott, about directing and writing um, this scene and this character. Um, was, was it um, difficult um, to, to kind of um, convey the respect that they had for each other because it came through so beautifully and it was so different than like a lot of films and series that show like the Russian nemesis as, um, you know, uh, not sympathetic. Well, uh, several things. First of all, the man playing Lushenko was actually our producer, Marcus Logos, <laughs> um, who I looked at his face and um, I thought, oh my God, I have to cast him in this. I didn't even know if he could act. I had just been around him and I love doing that. I tried to get Gary to play Borgoff, you know? Um, so, because 
look at him, he has a great face. So, um, uh, so that was one thing. Also, Gary and I in our conversations, you know, Gary's right, I changed so much of the script based on my conversation with him because he humanized the chess players. And I didn't want to have Ivan Drago across the board from her. You know, I wanted her to imagine him that way, but the reality is these are people with their own fears and their own kind of uh, very specific life in the Soviet Union. And, and there's a scene in the elevator that will lead to this scene, the, my discussion of this, that he, well, Gary said to me, you know, they would be, they would relate to her. She's like them. She cannot lose because what else does she have? So throughout the show, in every other chess match, she's very kind of steely and she's just destroying her players. And so with this one, the way the scene was written and the way I, you know, would talk to the actors was she is softer when he shows up. She is smiling when he shows up, unlike any other game in the entire show. She already likes him and um, and he um, is already impressed with her and he's watching her and even and every move she makes, there's a kind of, hmm, you know, from him, you know, you get kind of a thought and also the way Marcus is a very good chess player and you see him moving the pieces and he plays chess every day, all day. Um, so it was mostly about just the chemistry between the two of them and finding the way to really sell that and their faces did it all. So, so, and, and so I, I would be alternating between very tight shots of the board and their faces and it's all reaction. If you notice, everything is a reaction to the other person, which isn't always the way I'll shoot something. They're just constantly reacting to one another. And you see they like one another and it's infectious. It makes us like them as as well. Um, Gary, I read also in NPR that um, that Scott had you in mind for the role of Borgov, who we'll see, we'll see that hint from him in just a few minutes. Um, did you consider taking the role? Uh, yeah, I did consider, but it's it's very it's time consuming. It's uh, it would take so much of my time, so I just simply couldn't afford it. And uh, we, have, we had a brief, brief discussion uh, at our first uh, meeting in the restaurant uh, in New York. Uh, but I had, you know, it was tempting, but I had to turn it down because, again, I simply couldn't uh, carve enough time out of my out of my schedule um, uh, to do it properly. And um, and I said that I would do probably you know more good by by offering consultation and just you know being being a, an advisor that could do both chess and and the chess atmosphere and also the um, to make events that were according to the book were held in Moscow um, more uh, um, um, uh, um, realistic and um, uh, and uh, that's again that's that's it's it somehow was a reduction of my of my role but it's also um, it's also, um, you know, again, allowed me to concentrate on what what I thought I could do best. And yeah, when, that Gary says, when Gary says we had a brief discussion, what he means is I begged him. <laughs> 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 I begged him <laughs> to play the role. <laughs> well, I can understand why, because for those of you um, who, you know, don't, don't know, Gary Kasparov is not only known for being um, one of the greatest chess players of all time. Um, some say the greatest. Um, he's also got the best expressions, like you know, especially when he's playing. So I'm sure from a director's point of view, that would be so enticing. It would be a lot different, right? Like in an alternate universe where Gary did say yes, like how different do you think the writing would have been? Um, he probably would have been backseat directing the whole time, I'm sure. He's so smart. He would have figured out how to direct <laughs> and would have probably, if, I don't know, I probably would have spent longer because I would have been learning so much. And I would have made it about Borgov. Suddenly it would be the Borgov Beth story. <laughs> I think that would, would be what would have happened. And Gary can be very serious. You look at the photographs and very intimidating. And then as you see, when he smiles, there's this huge warmth and I needed somebody who could do that. And so, yeah, <laughs> I'll have to make a separate movie about Gary, I think. 
I was kind of happy to read that after I saw it because I was like, yeah, I, if, if I knew that while I was watching, I'd be thinking about it. So while we're talking about this, guys, I set up the position actually where um, the, the scene you showed started off. And I don't know if you were paying close attention, but I'm going to give a poll now and ask you um, what you would play here as Black, um, as Beth. It's it's and, more like you know more like checking their uh, checking uh, uh, their attention because the move was made. Uh, yeah, in, in the series, yes. And it was actually featured in Chess Life magazine. Our cover story right now is on the Queen's Gambit. It, it's a, a great story. Um, Scott is featured there as well. So if you read your Chess Life, you'll also know the move. But but um, Jennifer, it's this uh, since you show this game now, it's the. I have to say that the, the greatest challenge was uh, the, uh, at the board was to find the games that were good games, serious games for professional players, but also that the games that were as close to the book as possible. Because I uh, I, I thought first the task was impossible to 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 complete complete because many of the descriptions in the book they are not very professional as as you understand. So the and especially when you talk about the Germans and the way that this is being des described in the book, you know, it's not, um, it's not, uh, um, uh, it doesn't, it, 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 it didn't fit the, um, the, the, the normal flaw of the game. So I um, came up with an idea and worked with my associates to pick up the games that were as close as possible and then to deviate by creating new lines. Actually, this, in this position, everything that happens after age five is machine, it's machine check line. This is that's everything is just has been invented. But I think in, 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 in the games that's that I was responsible for, and it's all the top games she played, I always found a game that was as close to the book and to the to the story as possible because it, it helped to sort of to tie together the other non-chess elements. Um, and as you said now, uh, for for our for young chess players. We have to explain the concept of the German, and it's now it's it's to to find a game that you know left um, um, that was not decided uh, before move forty or you know left its intrigue uh, after move forty was challenging. So that's why in some games I I had to settle for uh, so called the German a uh, few moves earlier in these games or in 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 Borg of games, but. Um, I was quite happy just that with the help of machine, you know, our team, uh, little chess team, managed to create games that that uh, are, are real games, and uh, they they played at the level of uh, of well, world championship level. So uh, Elizabeth Harmon uh, um, uh, could be very proud of the of the quality of the games that that uh, that are carrying her name. Yeah, absolutely. And how how hard was that process? Did you like have to also talk it over with it, Scott to make it, sure that the writing kind of fit with the game text? It was quite quite a challenge because yeah, I looked at, I, I looked at uh, at at um, uh, just I I read I read the, the description of the game and naturally certain things I couldn't I couldn't manage, but I tried to be as close as possible, so I had a selection of the games for each game that I wanted to, to, um, to, to present in the movie. And I knew that there were very few moves uh, um, demonstrated on the board. I mean, Scott uh, reassured me that it's not a whole game, so there will be a few moments. But still, I know that many, I knew many chess players would be watching and they would be definitely saying, ah, Gary, this is, this, this is something wrong. And by the way, there were a couple of you know, uh, mistakes made when the position was set up, I was not around, so, but, the, the games themselves, they were carefully selected. I always had five, six options for each game. And eventually I, 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 I in every case, I came up with the, with the version that was, you know, as close as one can imagine to the Walter Tevis um, description. Um, whether this is the game with Lutsenko or, or the Borg of game or other games with, um, with uh, uh, um, Baltic or um, with Benny, um, actually, the game was Baltic. You know, it's this is I found the game was a queen sacrifice because she sacrificed a queen. <laughs> so I had to find a game, very old game, where that's exactly what's it's it's almost you know to to, to the point you know that's, that's it was a reflection of 
of the of the uh, Pevis uh, 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 story, uh, um, and you know, it's the game. The game was real. Amazing, yeah. It, it really was. So, it's so fun to like see the games that were featured in the series as serious chess players. It's like a second viewing of the series in a way. Speaking of which, um, I do have the results here for what you guys played in this position. Does anybody want to unmute themselves and say what you play here and why? Anybody want to unmute themselves and, and talk? Let's see. Um, you can raise your hand. Okay. Um, Tanishka? Um, so I said Rook C F7 because it um it's like a really strong battery with the queen and the two rooks that's like powering the f the f3 pawn um great and anybody else want to give their answer before we let um gary talk about what this game came from um rowan i said rook d4 because i think it's important that you need to get the queen into f4 and you do it with the tempo and they can't go like queen e3 or anything because of the rook on d1 all right, so we got two different answers. Um, and anybody else? Let's see. I got Anastasia. Okay, um, I I agree with the move Rook D4. I felt that it also like gained a tempo and it um, was like an aggressive move. I felt that some of the moves on the list were kind of passive and I feel that I like do moving like aggressive more and like starting to get my piece active. All right. Anybody play a move that um, wasn't suggested? Um, Lila? In the poll, I said Rook CF7, but now I think it's H5. Yes. Anybody else say H5? All right, Beatrice. Okay. Well, Gary, can you... Um, Alicia, you said H5 also. Why do you say H5? Yeah, well, this is if they watch the movie, it's H5, <laughs> but it, this, is, this is not the game, actually. This is the... It's... Um, it's a uh, uh, it's a prof it's a game of two two professional players. So and uh, it's um, um, two two grandmasters. Uh, but but the idea was H five and the, the whole line that you can show that's that's that was machine's invention. You can show this is this. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think Meg, you can show H five. G takes H five. Uh, King H eight. That's what she did. King H eight. Yeah, uh, it's a sacrificing pawns. Hg6, rook takes h4, um, rook h1, and here is this the rook h1, and here is a machine. Yeah, that's that's all I did. Rook c h7. Uh, that's the that's a machine's brilliance. Um, and if 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 white takes on h7, then queen g7 check, and 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 it, that's it. Uh, and it, that means that white has to. Um, uh, uh, either remove the rook or exchange the rooks, but in in any case, black has the size of attack. Uh, they can they can they can use a computer and check it. Yeah, this is a really five, nice. With one rook d4, that's the that's the end of the game. Yeah, king g7 first. Yes, bishop d7, rook d4. And this is what we saw at the end of that clip. Queen e3, rook, rook d1 check. Rook e1, bishop d4, resign. Yeah, and we saw this at the end of the clip for those of you who are like, I know you're, it's kind of easy to just kind of focus on like the the drama of the scene, not the chessboard in the first viewing, but this is exactly what we just saw. So it's pretty fun to like watch the game. But for those of you who said rook cf7, that was actually what was played in the stem game, right? So it's 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 a it's a good it's a good grandmaster move. So you, you should not be <laughs> this is, yeah, it's 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 not as good as 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 Liz Harbin, but but it's it's as good as as Grandmaster Copia. <laughs> who's a who's a very strong grandmaster. Exactly. So yes, that's the point, yes. All right, so let's show the um other clip that is just you know one of my all-time favorite scenes in the series. So that was just such an amazing scene. I'm sorry I had to cut it off because um, I could have gone for another two minutes, but I know most of you will get a chance to see the series. If not, your parents don't let you watch it now. It'll, you know, you can watch it in a couple of years. And uh, this, this scene was just so incredible, Scott. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, directing and writing this scene? Um, yeah, this was very difficult. Um, um, 
shooting chess in general is very difficult, but the, the trick here was you're trying to create tension for people, even people who don't play chess. And early on, um, I created a kind of language where she visualizes when she lives, grows up in that orphanage, she's visualizing chess pieces on the ceiling. And that's how she kind of works out her, her prop solves her problems. And so um, this was a, just a lot of design and a lot of very specific shots because obviously we had to create those chess pieces on the ceiling later digitally through visual effects. So when you were looking up at the ceiling, you just saw the ceiling. And in the case of the dormitory, there was no ceiling because it was a stage. So we created everything. But in the case of this, um, so we had to be very specific where people were looking, how the camera moved, because I knew it was going to come up and the pieces were going to come into frame, into foreground. Um, so we just, it's just one of those things where it was all about her um, kind of getting herself together. <laughs> And everything was sort of building up to that. And he didn't do what she thought he was gonna do. The whole point of it was she had a whole series of moves mapped out and predicated on him making certain moves and he didn't. And so she had to kind of change her whole, her whole plan. So that's one of those things that's super, super, just very technical. It's like a chess game. You're working out all the moves ahead of time, where the camera goes, how, who are you gonna shoot? Who are you gonna, you know, every shot is carefully mapped out and we just kind of do them. There was a giant crane in that hall that was in Berlin actually, but there was a 30 foot crane that we could move up and down and it would go around to the booths where the guys were, where the announcers were talking and it's all, for a little chess game, it was this massive production. It was crazy. Just an extraordinary scene. Um, my favorite. And uh, Gary, talk to us about the game that this was based on, right? It was Wolf Ivanshuk. Oh, yes, it's the, it's, I got a few days ago, I got a message from Patrick saying, ah, I recognize the game, Harmonborg. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, and he was, he was quite shocked that I actually, I, I found the game, which is not, you know, it's, it's not uh, the famous game. It was played in the, in the interzonal in Bill in 1993. But, uh, you know, my search was based, as I said already, on the description of the game. And that was especially challenging because I knew everybody would be watching this game. That's the, that's the it's a climax of the whole show. And, uh, and I didn't want to deviate uh, from the game, but though I had to make some concessions because according to the book, it was, it was uh, Albin, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gambit and that moved too. And that's, I, I decided, no, that's, that's too much. No, that's that's it. Couldn't be a choice of the world champion. And um, now uh, the idea was to is to um, uh, to play something that would be um, complicated enough. And I I I I I, I could have chosen games played by Kings Indian or Grunfeld, but it's a Queen's Gambit. The title of the show, you know, basically limited my choice. It had to be Queen's Gambit. And right. I thought that okay, there are two choices. Either it's a decline. It could be it could be Queen's Gambit accepted, but then how you make sure that the game you know is it, the intrigue is there, the game is not um, uh, is not decided uh, one way or another, or the many changes. So and I I suggested that the search would be would be um, on that line. It's taken on c4, e4, and knight c6. That was my suggestion to 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 uh, my associate, either knight c6 or knight f6. To create a position where you know um, we could move, you know, to comfortably to move thirty or thirty-five without exchanging the pieces, because I also wanted to make sure that the adjournment, you know, is 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 real. It's not that you know the game is adjourned, but uh, and it's we needed we needed intrigue and we needed um, um, this very emotional um, uh, scene of of uh, Benny and his friends calling from New York. I had to keep the, the position very much alive. So uh, knowing that you had uh, um, uh, a Soviet team, you know, on one side analyzing. So I knew that it would be possible to have a position that is very, very complicated, but at least I wanted, I wanted to make sure it's, it's, it's not elementary and it's, it's, it's really challenging. 
So uh, if I had six or seven candidates and I picked up this one and the adjournment in our, uh, in our story was at move 36, I think H3 was the, because we wanted to uh, make sure that you know, she seal, seals the move, I think it was H3. And then it's, it was, again, it, we were lucky. It was almost, you know, as, as in the book, that is just, you know, it talks about him, you know, pushing the rook and then, you know, just uh, uh, finding this, this quiet move B3. So um, uh, again, as close as possible. And, um, and we got, uh, we got uh, um, I mean, an outstanding result. So I was so happy when it's, 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 it's happened because I just realized that this, 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 could, be the, this could be a, a true uh, uh, um, Harlem Borg game. And nobody, nobody could blame us for um, for uh, being negligent to the uh, to the chess, call it chess truth, chess uh, um, uh, authenticity of, of of the game, um, and um, uh, and it, it it was checked by computer. And this is, by the way, machine immediately tells you that when white pawn reaches e seven, it's already winning for white. But of course, you know, um, it's it it. Um, uh, offered uh, her the opportunity to to think about about uh, uh, Borgov's draw offer, and it's it became very natural. That's fascinating. So you're saying that you um, like decided on the opening, and then you did like a a chess based search for like you know top grandmaster games on yeah. certain year span. Yeah, it's the it's, it, again the, my, the choice of the opening was dictated by the fact that. I needed to keep as many pieces as possible to move by, by move thirty or thirty-five. So, uh -huh. and also, I uh, I didn't want to deviate from the queen's gambit. So, uh, I looked at the queen's gambit accepted, and this this um, at move three, uh, uh, knight c six or knight f six could offer me the best options. And I had few games with knight f six as well. But then I saw that this line with the with a knight c six and then e five knight goes on g six. It keeps all the pieces on the board for a long time. So intuitively, I thought that could be a good chance. And then well, it's the, uh, my associate found actually the game, uh, this, this one. And uh, I liked the game. And then we just, you know, we, we went through the game and found that it could be a phenomenal line because it should be tricky enough for Borgov to fall in the trap. Uh, it's not that complicated. And um, I doubt that the professional Soviet team, you know, would have missed it in the adjournment, but again, it's as close as I could get. So in this position that we see right now, the source game that you used for this um, with uh, Ivan Shuk against Patrick Wolf, who's an American grandmaster. Uh, he, played, and... he played very poorly. He, played, he made a bad move, G4, and, 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 and got very, very quickly got a lost position. So 96 is much stronger. Uh, why is G4 a bad move? Because then that what's happened in the game, just the black, you know, exchanged uh, uh, their, their two bishops for two knights. And activated, uh, and activated uh, um, their rook, and um, it's the position is is pretty pretty lousy. Right. So, said, yes. Yeah. And all so, this the the white pawns are weak, and the king is 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 weak. So ninety ninety six is a really good move, and um, and now position is is it's, it's it's good for white. It's not it's not winning, but it's good for white, and, and most importantly, it gave us a chance to create. To create this the um, uh, this uh, uh, this narrative that um, followed almost religiously followed um, uh, the book description. Yeah, I'm amazing. Before I ask how I'm going to show the the climax of this game, but um, I understand that uh, the director and the creator um, Scott Frank does have to jump off. Do you have time for one more question, Scott? Sure. Uh, because we have a filmmaker chess player in the audience who really um, wanted to ask you one question. Her name is Bianca. Bianca, you want to unmute yourself and ask? Yes. Hi, I'm Bianca Mitchell. I'm 15 and I'm a filmmaker. Um, and I was curious, I'm really uh, interested in the aesthetic of Queen's Gambit. And I was curious in how you came up with that concept. Um, the aesthetic was, I wish I could show you. I. I always like to have a very specific palette and group of colors that I use. And we had been scouting a location in 
Canada actually in a hotel lobby and we were taking pictures of a chessboard that was in the lobby and a little girl ran by in a yellow dress and we got this picture that was very, very striking. And I realized that's the look of the show, this photograph in this dark lobby with this chessboard, with this blurry image of this young girl running by in the yellow dress. And I gave that image to everyone. And I said, this is the palette for the show. And then we just start thinking about, you know, each of the characters and what they might look like and, and all the colors work together. So the costume designer knew what a room would look like so that the costumes would work in the room. And at the very beginning, there's not a lot of color at the orphanage. And then back in when we're in the Soviet Union at the end, there's also not a lot of color. But she is always either in, in bright colors or in checks or in the very end, she's in all in white, looking like the white queen. And so um, all of it was, was that's sort of how we did it. We kind of came first from an image that made me feel the tone, felt like the right tone, and then thinking about each character. What is the right feeling for each character? And thank you so much, Scott. And by the way, we're, I'm sure you're gonna get this question a million times, but we did get it a lot. I, I know you, you know, you already know what I'm going to ask you. Season two, Queen's Gambit, is there any chance for it? <laughs> Not today. I mean, I don't know what I would do with her. I feel like that was such a good story. I worry that anything I added to it would just, you know, rain on what had come before. So I think for now, I think that's it. But you never know. <laughs> I, yeah, you never know. <laughs> Well, um, everybody give a, give a hand for um, Scott Frank. Thank you so much, not only for coming, but just for making The Queen's Gambit because it's, it's so inspiring and gonna bring so many people into the game. Thank you all, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye Jennifer, bye Gary. Bye, bye Scott, thank you. All right, so we were just about to talk about 96 and how the film diverged, the series rather, diverged when 96 was played and um, a better move than Wolf played, right? And uh, then we got to the moment in the clip I showed you um, rather soon, right? The clip I showed you. So now um, after Knight takes D6, Knight F8 is threatened. So Black has to play this in-between move of taking the Knight on E6, right? And that's what gives that beautiful pawn, right? Yep. And um, and here um, we saw the the bishop c5 move, which was really a huge focus of the c the climactic scene. Um, why do you think that was, Gary? Is like bishop c5 is it just because that like becomes like the key piece that almost functions as as strong as a queen? No, it's the look. It's the again um, these days, you know, every computer will show you that white is already winning, uh, but uh, it's. Um, um, to the naked human eye, it may not be that clear. Uh, and um, and according to the book, you know, the Borg of, uh, offered her draw. Uh, the draw was, you know, was a good outcome because they would tie first and that would be a phenomenal success. And uh, she already lost two games to Borg of so, and she had to make, a, it was a big choice, accepting draw or rejecting. Again, it's, I challenge anyone to to come come up with a better better suggestion how you can have a game that is in theory is adjourned and then you know a world champion offers a draw and uh, and it's you know the draw for is should look real because he cannot offer draw in a loss position so and and I, again I I think it's as close as one can get uh, and um, and she did a very good job by by contemplating his offer but but her mind was traveling elsewhere. And that's why she looked at the ceiling and it's, it was a big, big, big choice for her. And, um, and she did, she, she, she was, she was right. She just, you know, she, she evaluated the position and, um, and made all the right moves. Again, it's, it's quiet moves like King H2 because black is defenseless. Black has nothing to do. Just, they cannot stop a uh, white, white piecing going around blacks, you know, going around and penetrating Black's camp and uh, and uh, this pawn on E7, it's, uh, it's, you know, decides the game. And uh, a rook, a rook on E4 is, is, is quite miserable because it's, uh, it's, it's in the center and it just, it's, it has no moves. It's, it's, 
it's just an easy target for white. And, um, you know, at every moment, black would love this rook to go back to a eighth rank to, to um, stop the pawn, but it cannot. So it's the pawn on e5 prevents it from, you know, playing a much more active role in defending. Right. And then in, 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 uh, you saw in the clip just how beautiful the the calculations are in the ceiling translated to the game that follows. So after that, there was some more really gorgeous sequences. Um, Gary, what was your favorite um, scene from the series after you watched it? Oh, uh, that's hard to say. I just, you know, I, I think there's some really great moments. I think the one that when she, I love very much when she, First met Borgov in she she saw him in in the zoo with his family. That's that's powerful moment. And um, um, I um, also think it's the it's very sentimental moment. I I I love it. And I made a couple of suggestions how to improve it from the book. Is when she is back in the orphanage and uh, uh, she find she 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 visits the, the room where she was taught how to play chess, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, her deceased teacher we call this man who introduced her to chess and she saw this the um all the uh, newspaper clips and the magazines it's like you know um it was like a, a, a chapel or just you know it's this she was a goddess for 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 this old man and uh, and and uh, again it's i think it's very touching um um but it's i think it's the what makes this series unique is that it, it's I don't want to say, um, I mean, to be critical of, of other chess movies, but it's so human because it's just, you know, she's, you can feel that it's, she's going through all these challenges, you know, it's the, and uh, she, she and people who, who are helping her, it's just, they, again, it's so natural. And I, and I, I, I enjoyed these, the concept. I, I could see it in the script when I just read it. And when we had this long conversation with Scott and then several phone calls afterwards, that you know he was on the right track of of uh, making the first series about chess that will make people you know recognize that the game it's a great game and it's it's not just the game that make people turn people crazy it's a game that can help people to to overcome their uh, their uh, difficulties um, it's uh, it's in in my um, article ten years ago it's the uh, it's um, I have a review of the of the Fisher's biography by Brady and. And I, I argue that it's it was not the game of chess that made Fisher crazy, but actually it's the game of chess that probably kept him sane for for a long time. Mm -hmm. So that's just, that shows the beauty of chess, uh, its excitement, but also its its value. And um, that's why I think the series was unique. And uh, and I can hardly pick up you know one you know the, the favorite favorite uh, scene again. There, there are quite a few of them. Yeah, I agree though. That was a that was totally brilliant. The um the janitor who taught her chess. Yeah. Well, this was wonderful. We do have a couple questions. Um, I know you're very busy, Gary, so we appreciate your time. Um, but we'll just take a couple. Um, from the Russian players you have seen in the history, who has the closest chess style to Borgov? That was an excellent question from um Thahansa, um, who's 11 years old. Uh, as I said, and, and and Scott confirmed, you know, it's it's the all the characters they're composite. So it's you cannot have one, you know, uh, uh, player that could be exactly bored of. Uh, he played uh, more active chess. I um, speaking about world champions, uh, maybe Spassky. Yeah, maybe Spassky. So it gets, again, it's I don't want to be to be to be quoted as saying, oh, it's Spassky. No, it just you look for someone who just you know with with the um, um, with the special chess style and 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 and, um, and you look at the games that he played against uh, um, Harmon at uh, earlier in in the show uh, the game in Mexico and and the game in Paris totally outplaying her you know just being you know very positional or or uh, in the second game just you know using her passive. Uh, passive play in the opening because she was, as we remember, she she was not totally unprepared for the game um, psychologically. So um, I would I would pick up Spassky, but I, I could come up with few other you know names that uh, that are probably less known. But among the world champions, I would probably go with, go with uh, Spassky. But uh, I, I would I would 
be very cautious in 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 in, in um, any attempt to identify uh, um, these fictional characters as uh, um, with with someone who, who was a real chess player. That that I did think of Spassky's too um, when I saw the character Sanvi. I'm going to unmute you and let you ask your question. It was excellent. The one that you submitted via the form, Sanvi. Um, so my question was, how important is it for men to encourage women to continue playing chess or to get started playing chess? Look, I, I hope that this, this, this series will encourage many parents uh, to uh, encourage their, 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 their daughters to, to uh, enter the world of chess. Because um, it's, it's not just, you know, your own decision when you are just a little, obviously you, 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 you have to, to be um, um, fascinated by the game. So you just, you know, you, you have to show your passion. But at the end of the day, it's it's a lot can can depend on parents, and I think the the, the book, and the, and the movie, the series, uh, shows that chess could play a very good, very very important role in in shaping the character. And uh, while we know that it's very few of of those who are doing chess now, uh, they could become professional players. But it's it's about the contribution of the game for the future, and I think it's it will have. It's uh, it's really you know I think it's it will it will push many parents to reconsider their view uh, of uh, and, and a positive impact of the uh, of the game of chess, um, and um, I think that's 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 one of the reasons I I wanted this series to be a success. Great, and um, we also have Grandmaster Irina Crush in the house, and she just gave our last lesson actually, and she has a question as well. Hi, Gary. So I noticed that Elizabeth's uh, favorite opening was the Sicilian, and I was wondering if that was your touch or was that written into the book? Uh, Irina, it's the it's 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 in the book. Yeah, oh. this is, I, no, I, I liked it. So this is that's again they have choice, but it's but it's in the book. So it's the he didn't specify which Sicilian, so that's why you know you could see neither. But but it's but it's 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 the whole all her openings that were in the book and. And sometimes, you know, they even quoted um, uh, uh, things that I, I would rather, you know, cut, like, you know, 11 fish attack against dragon. <laughs> I, but this is, again, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do everything. And, and um, again, I, I wanted to limit my, uh, my um, creative contribution by guaranteeing that the, all the key games, they will, they will be of the highest quality. And whether it's a game against Giriev, you look at, uh, at this, this H5 move, it's again. It's almost exactly as in the book. You know, she made she made it, and an, it's a pawn's breakthrough, and it's a it's it's a line. It's not a game, but it's one of the line, one of the possible lines from Yakovenko game, for instance. So it's this, uh, and and I have to say that the moment I I, I found the game, um, uh, Ivan Chukvov, I was very happy because I knew this is this is something I was all looking for. And we have one. Other question from um, Sarah. Can you unmute yourself, Sarah? So my question is, who is the strongest woman player you have ever played against? Oh, uh, it's a. Uh, I, I think I, 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 I heard you asking about, you know, the, the strongest human player I ever faced. It's very easy. I mean, it's the, by far the strongest female player uh, was Judith Polder. And, uh, uh, she was the only female player that made it to top ten, and uh, and she, you know, she was a real competitor. So it's, and that's why I was I was always surprised when people say, "Ah, oh, you played, you know, a female player." And once I lost her a game in rapid chess, and they said, "Oh, how come?" I said, "I didn't lose to a female player. I lost to a number ten in the world." So that's the what's the what's what? Well, it's not a big business. So you, you you win, you lose. So I, you know, I I could have lost to 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 one of the top players and judith was the the very tough competitor to many of us um was what were the differences and similarities between judith and beth in the series because i couldn't help but notice of course that they both have this amazing red hair <laughs> <laughs> i i doubt very much that you know that tevis had uh, had, had the red red hair uh, uh, a female player when they wrote the book, a, a, a mm -hmm. real chess player, because Judith was what? She was six or seven when the book was written. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but uh, very aggressive chess, very aggressive chess. But it is also this, the, it's uh, 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 
the, the difference is it's as stark as one can imagine. Uh, Judith uh, uh, was part of the chess family. She had two sisters. She had a father and mother. And father, you know, uh, had his own system of, of training them. So she grew up in a very different atmosphere. Harmon was, was an orphan. And it's the, um, I would say that if you look for, for, for a prototype, it's, uh, and I think it's what Tavis probably had in mind, it's, it's like a female version of Bobby Fischer. It's just, it's, the, it's, it's more American, it's challenging. And, uh, and he was looking for some, you know, extreme situation. So orphanage in Kentucky, I mean, just it's the, it's probably the most unlike place to, to find the chess talent. But, but it's, uh, it's the, what also I liked about, about this, the concept is that it proved my, uh, my long held belief that talent exists everywhere. It's about an opportunity. And the opportunity and the, the, the this fate could could be you know could show up in in form of this janitor that knew very little about the game. So it's the and the, when the talent was discovered and uh, and she got a few people that helped her just to move you know from one stage to another. Then again, then the talent manifests itself and um, and it's hopefully to it have impact uh, on on female chess you know beyond American. Frontiers, but naturally the United States should be the uh, should benefit greatly from um, such a you know compelling story. Absolutely, and just to to wrap up, we're getting a lot of questions from people as usual about you know how they can use this series to kind of like inspire themselves to be better players, especially during this pandemic where they can't play over the board. Um, any thoughts on that? Look, uh, the beauty of chess that you can play it online as well. But it's, uh, I would encourage them to, to read more about chess. Again, when I say read, you don't have to read books. You can just do it online, but educate yourself. But just, you know, uh, one thing that, that's, that that's this series t- uh, tells you that even without, you know, professional chess coach and uh, Elizabeth Harmon didn't have access to computers. They didn't exist. They didn't have good coaches, uh, 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 but she read books. And she read them and, 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 and the chess books and chess magazines help her to, to, um, to advance. And uh, naturally, this is uh, today you can, have, you, can, you can have every book you want on your Kindle uh, chess book or, just, or download the games on, on your computer. And studying these games, reading the stories about the games, re- understanding what's the, what is the rationale of this or that move, uh, it's, it could be a tremendous help. So and then when you when you uh, leave this lockdown and uh, and the quarantine is over, so you can um, uh, you can reap the benefits of this uh, a wise investment of your time by you know if now you you read books and you work hard on improving your chess. Amazing. Well, Gary, I'm getting a lot of comments about how um, you should reconsider next time and star in the next chess movie. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. seriously, um, big thank you to Gary, everybody. Um, uh, well, uh, so grateful for your time and again, your work on this series. So uh, we- Okay, yes, uh, I just, you know, it's getting late here because as I said, I'm in, I'm in Europe now. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's um, uh, half past 11 uh, and uh, you know, it's late though. Of course, I, I, I would, um, I would, uh, um, uh, mislead you if, if if I say that after after goodbye I would switch on my computer I will I will look at the at the at the, at the vote count. <laughs> to say that's the, <laughs> yeah, but um, that's yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. That's for this invitation. I hope that this 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 series and uh, and and the, the coverage of the series will will help will help chess uh, in America, especially. Um, uh, American female chess, and it will elevate the status of the game to, to where it belongs. It's just, it's the, it's, I think the female chess has been neglected for so long. And, uh, and it's, I hear many comments from people I'm working on other things on AI, on decision-making, you know, it's, it's everybody talks about, uh, um, uh, uh Queens, uh, Queens Gambit. I even, uh, a couple of days ago, I had an in, in an interview on on, on uh, a Russian speaking radio, one of the few remaining uh, um, uh, free uh, uh, radios in Russia, and the 
and just before it ended, they said, oh, we, we, we have to ask you one question. It's about, tell us about Queen's Gambit. Tell us about your role in the Queen's Gambit. So it's, it's, it's everywhere. And, um, and I think that's, the, that's one, of the, one of the great things that happened to chess during this lockdown. And um, we, should, uh, we should not uh, waste this great opportunity. Well, again, thank you so much. Brilliant series. And thank you everybody for coming today. It's been a crazy week and it, you know, this has been for me personally, just a wonderful um, one hour of total absorption, which is in many ways, the role of chess itself. So thank you all. And thank you very much to Gary and to Scott who was here earlier. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.